Welcome to the Onran Fan Club. I'm Scott Schiff along with William Swig. William, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Good, good. It's a big episode number 40. And, uh, you know, we have some clips of your own interacting with me. Um, I know, uh, you know, you're a little bit more ambivalent about uh, talking about, uh, you know, uh, more your own stuff. Right. I'm just concerned about, you know, talking too much about your own. I'm not sure we should even bother discussing what he has to say, um, because Primarily, I don't want to get bogged down in his bullshit. He, he doesn't um, pay much attention to us or, you know, our arguments. So, you know, why continue the dialogue? It's, um, he's, if he's going to resort to just calling us names, then we can address that a little bit. But as far as delving into his opinions or his uh, streaming of his consciousness, it's kind of, you know, to put it, uh, one way, it's, it's not very interesting. That's fair. I mean, for me, it comes back to the what I consider unfair charge against David Kelly and friends that, you know, Kelly in particular was misrepresenting Rand's ideas. And so when I heard your own said that, you know, Trump supporters are fifth column objectivists, he later tried saying he meant apologists, you know, I started listening to his show because I thought he was misrepresenting Rand and, and even peak off if objectivism meant rolling over for the wokes, even as they were gaining cultural dominance. Well, there is that uh, argument that he is like the main figurehead in the ARI side of the objectivist movement. And so when he says something, it's uh, potentially important to have an opinion about it and put your argument out there or your opinion. Um, and so when he says something about David Kelly or he says something about Trump supporters, it resonates in the movement and um, it, it's important to address it. I can see that. Sure. And uh, so he and I have had some interactions, he even brings you up in one of these. And uh, I thought I'd summarize the ones that I thought covered the most essential issues I mean, for example, Yaron has said that uh, Leonard Peikoff's dim hypothesis was the main reason that he saw the left as a greater, that he saw the right as a greater threat than the left. And we've done a show on the political evolution of Leonard Peikoff, and Yaron once cavalierly mentioned that maybe Peikoff had changed his mind. So you know, I actually asked your own if he thought it worthwhile to get clarification directly from Peikoff on this essential issue. Oh, Scott, 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 Scott. All right, Scott asked, you've said that Leonard Peikoff uh, perhaps changed his mind on the threat of the right versus left since writing Dim. Would it be worth asking him at some point? Um, Leonard Peikoff is um, retired. I can say that he's explicitly asked me not to talk to him about these kind of issues. And we don't. So, um, no, I mean, he's retired. He obviously doesn't want to talk about it. If he wanted to, he'd probably make a public statement. He knows my views. He knows the discussion. I mean, he is free to comment on it, but he is, he takes his retirement, I think, seriously. And it's, it's not to say he doesn't have opinions and not to say his opinions agree with mine. I, you know, on some issues, they don't. You know, how many times does he have to say my name before I think I'm asking a relevant question? Yeah, he said your name eight times. <laughs> I mean, this isn't just some issue. This is whether or not, you know, we're sanctioning our own destroyers based on whether or not we choose the right side. I mean, this is a time where, you know, based on their, their long history, your own could be as respectful as possible, but say, you know, I want to honor your legacy, Leonard. Please help me understand why you see the left as a greater threat and how that fits in with your dim hypothesis. Right. I think that if they have a good relationship, then he could ask Leonard about this issue and whether Leonard's changed his mind on anything in DIM. Uh, 
it, I think it speaks more to the nature of the relationship that Leonard doesn't want to talk to him about politics. So it's like, if it, it can't be that great of a friendship, if the most important question in politics, you know, whether to side with the right or the left or stay neutral or b attack both sides or what to do, if you can't talk about that with your, your, one of your best friends, then, you know, what's, what's the, what kind of friendship is that? Not. Right. And, you know, I mean, he said that Peikoff said he asked Yaron not to talk to him about it. But since then, uh, this past February of 2022, uh, during Leonard Peikoff's appearance with Amy Peikoff, he did try to clarify publicly that he sees National Socialism on its way from the Democrats. So I figured now that Peikoff was talking about it, Maybe your own can realize that, that Peikoff may be trying to tell him something too. So I asked your own about Peikoff's quote to hopefully get him to question Dim as, as just automatically meaning to downplay the threat of critical race theory, or, or at least now to be able to go to talk to Leonard about it. Uh, Scott. LP said, I believe that totalitarianism is in the form of some kind of national socialism is on its way that the Democrats are pushing forward. Isn't it fair to see that the Democrats as the main threat? It's no question that the Democrats are pushing forward, but the, I still think that the main threat is the response that they will get. It's the Hitler to the communists in Weimar, Germany. Jeroen has a right to that view, but he seems to be ignoring what Peikoff is trying to explain. I mean, Yaron dances around an even bigger word salad for five minutes, and we'll put up a link uh, before, um, you know, but he, um, but he summarizes that it's crucial to mete out punishment for, in essence, voting the same way as Peikoff. The Republican Party needs to be punished for voting for Trump, so that we can, <laughs> so that we can um, get somebody so we can get somebody better. If we don't get somebody better than Trump, then it was all for nothing, but then it doesn't matter. We're heading towards authoritarianism no matter what. If Trump is the solution to the left, we are heading towards authoritarianism faster than any of us could imagine. If that's it, if that's the solution, then we are on the verge of national socialism. Yes. He acts like objectivists haven't been recognizing the threat of fascism for decades. Right. It's like it's it's like Trump is this last, you know. Trump is our last ditch effort. Is that what he's saying? It's like if, if Trump is the solution, then there's no solution. <laughs> I don't I don't get his uh, rhetoric there. I don't understand. I mean, you're kind of hitting it on the head. He's in essence said in the past that the left has already won, and so it's kind of a continuation of that theme that there there is no solution, and that you know, in in some ways, he's he said things that indicate that he's not a big DeSantis fan either. So. It's it, the, the point isn't that we think Trump is the solution and, you know, that he's going to fascism or something like that. It's it's that Trump is just better than the Democrats. So the, the, the Democrats, if we vote for the Democrats and keep them in power, they're going to bring about the actual fascist state. You know, they're. Yeah, I just don't understand um, what what his prediction is these days because he's very into making predictions. Well, right. It's it's in essence that you know no one's going to stand up to the whoever stands up to the left is going to be a fascist, and so anyone it makes anyone who stands up to the left suspicious. He, when, well, he also said, sorry. He also said that if Trump is the solution, then we're already in a totalitarian state. I mean, like we're, there's no hope. So he should be able to prove that. I mean, he should have tons of evidence to say, well, look, it's already, you know, it's already 
a foregone conclusion that Trump is not going to stop it. So where's the evidence? Like, where's the evidence that we just, Trump is not the solution and uh, we're going to be a totalitarian state and there's no point voting. You know, like, where is the evidence for that? These are just his assertions of how he has interpreted the dim hypothesis, even if it's apparently not the way Leonard Peikoff has interpreted it. Well, I think he's living in the 2013 dim world. Well, Peikoff has progressed to today's dim world. I think there's some sort of change in Leonard's attitude. And I think he's probably realized, you know, that the left is the worst, you know, budding religion. You know, they're the real M2 threat. If, if you were to use the, the dim, you know, theory. I think it may go back a little earlier than that. I think uh, he saw, you know, what was going on with Obama. And I suspect that Peikoff was uh, related to the burgeoning relationship with the, the Tea Party that they at least attempted around 2010. Um, yeah, that's possible, I guess. I don't know too much about that. Yeah. Um, and so... Um, you know, then there's this, uh, there's a next show where, um, you know, Euron is talking about, you know, left versus right and uh, the culture wars. And, and in the chat, I say that we want someone to push back on cancel culture. Then you want somebody to push back on cancel culture, then go find somebody to push back on cancel, cancel culture. There are plenty of people pushing back on cancel culture. So go do it. Scott. Why haven't you done it, Scott? <laughs> He's actually inspired me to, to join up with the Atlas Society since they're more open to working with other liberty groups. But yeah. um, <laughs> after that, I, I respond in the chat that whoever does it for better or worse will ultimately take over the right. Whoever does it will take over the right. Great, then go uh, uh, Lindsay, Lindsay, what's his name? Something Lindsay. Is, has been attacking the cancer culture nonstop. Is he gonna be the dominant force on the right? I doubt it. I doubt it. <laughs> what an attitude. You know, a, a little bit of a postscript, uh, six months later, someone was suggesting that Yaron uh, interview James Lindsay and, and Yaron was telling his audience, uh, hey, I, I tried to get in touch with him on Twitter and he didn't respond. So if any of you know how to get in touch with him, I'd like to have him on. So, uh, you know, Lindsay got more uh, cultural dominance since then, even if he's since been banned from Twitter. Yeah, well, James got what Yaron wanted. Remember when Yaron wanted to be banned from everything or canceled? <laughs> That's right. Now James Lindsay is the big name who's getting canceled. So, yeah, I know maybe maybe you were right. He should have gone after cancel culture. It's not too late. <laughs> well, he's got to he's going to have to make some really outrageous statements now. He's going to have to, you know, go after like homo like homosexual marriage or something like that. <laughs> well, I reply that that Lindsay's already gained a lot of influence in the movement. And Yaron continues uh, showing how open he is to suggestions. Anyway, I'm going to push back on culture. culture what, in proportion to what I think it requires in ways that differentiate us. But my bigger concern is that you are tempted by the right that you attempted by collectivism, that you attempted by statism, that your hatred of the left causes you to become irrational. And I see that on this chat all the time. Yeah, he's just looking after your uh, rationality and objectivity. Saving us from temptation. Yeah. Is that the purpose of morality? I guess he sees the right as, you know, the... Um fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's partially why I played that was the kind of management response. It's like, 
I'm going to respond in the manner I see fit. And, you know, so he only wants to fight it to the level he sees as appropriate. And this comes up later because, you know, I suggest that I'm glad that, you know, when he's finally uh, starts to see it as more of a threat later. Yeah, but note that he, the main threat to him is the response to the Democrats pushing for socialism. But I remember a time when pushing for socialism was the main threat, or social, socialism itself is the main threat. But no, now in this twisted world of ideologies, the response is the threat, but the response is occurring now. So I guess he's talking about a future response. This is some some other like prophecy he has, you know, there's going to be a response in the future, which is Hitlerian, right. and Nazi, there's going to be Nazis running all around. And we Republican can't try Party. to stop the left all this time, because whatever we do, that's going to be the right wing fascist. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, he says, you know, he's against both sides, but the real threat is the response to the lesser threat so it's like <laughs> but once you start trying to define that response it looks less and less like hitler and more and more like just confused republicans trying to figure things out well my point is why don't we try to actually you know diffuse the uh wokes now before the the reaction to it grows into what he's worried about yeah, I mean, he's well, he would say that he's all about that, too. He's I mean, in another clip, he says something like, um, I spend more time attacking the right than I do the left. So that's just an admission that I, th I think that's an admission that he considers. No, no, I got that backwards. He spends more time attacking the left than the right. And so that's an admission that he sees the left as a bigger threat. Yeah, and that actually um, comes into another clip I had with him. Um, I asked him, in essence, if woke CRT is just nihilist, like he suggests, and can't win long term, then why is uh, the Ayn Rand Institute's OAC even wasting time doing a class on critical race theory, which they just announced? Scott is always trying to be obnoxious, um, and, and, but he puts $5 on a question, so at least he's putting his money where his obnoxiousness is. Um, I noticed the CRT class at OAC. Instead of saying, good, I'm so happy there's a CRT class in, 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 at OAC, or spin it like this if you want to kind of a put down, I'm glad to see that the admin institute is taking CRT seriously enough to have a CRT class at the OEC. That that would be, that would not be Scott though. That would be somebody else. I actually appreciate his attempt at being jocular, but you know, how much of it is because he's not used to challenging questions from the rest of the audience. Um, well, so he says that you're always trying to be obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> So as long as you pay him, you can be obnoxious, I guess. So he, he doesn't want to ban anybody or, you know, cut anybody out or stop people from being obnoxious, but he'll point it out all day and he'll call you names. And so it's just, it's a little bit of a weird reaction. It's like, if I thought someone was obnoxious, I don't want that in my life. No, I, don't, right. I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to be reading some chat that's obnoxious. And that brings me to his chat the nature of his chat. He says that um, reading his chat, you know, they're all irrational, like not all, but you know, he's he, every day there's irrational people bothering him in his chat. I'm like, well, what is wrong with your chat? You know, why, why are you producing that kind of chat? It's a, I don't know. It's like, imagine if you were in real life and everybody around you was, a, and you just put up with it. It's like, he's like the main advocate now of tolerating people. Like in his chat, you got to tolerate Scott and you got to tolerate everybody else. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's hear the rest of the question that made him react like that. 
Um, but no, this is the question. Shouldn't there be one on conservative nationalism or whatever right-wing threat is supposed to be around the corner? <laughs> I think AOI is counting on me to carry the load on conservative nationalism. They just delegated it to me. I will keep talking. ARI delegates things to Iran? It, part of the culture war. Um, yeah. You know, look, was it sarcastic on my part? Absolutely. It is still a fair question. I'm asking for consistency about his own pronouncements. I mean, why even have a class about CRT if it's nihilistic and can't be a long-term threat? Why not more classes about, you know, Tucker Carlson or whatever right-wing authoritarian that's destined to take over. I mean, this is the same man, Yaron, who said that the left has been winning for the last hundred years. How much longer are we waiting for, for uh, Tucker Carlson to run for president, you know, while the left takes control of our institutions? Well, this may be an error on your part, you know, asking for consistency. You know? <laughs> I don't know if that's possible. Um, you know, he, you know, he's just streaming his consciousness on these shows. And uh, if I were to do that, I'm sure and find some, you know, contradictions here and there. I don't think there'd be as big of a contradiction as some of the stuff you're on been saying. Um, but no one's going to be precise in all of their thinking. You know, this is why I don't stream my consciousness. <laughs> I write notes, I have well prepared notes, and I try to stick to my points. So I'm not always just thinking off the cuff. Um, but it seems like Iran does a lot of that. There's a, you know, there's a place for that. And I admit, I mean, it would be uh, really challenging to have to do that. So I mean, it is impressive. But, uh, you know, I, I even will give a pass on the small issues as long as you get the big issues right. Um, right. When you take when he's taking the main point of his episode is a contradiction to something he made a main point earlier. That's going to stand out. So I think when he does these these sleight of hand shifts in his opinion, like he'll go from saying CRT is boring and not interesting and let someone talk about it to I talk about it more than anybody or, you know, <laughs> I'm always talking about it. The, these you know, are, uh, you're getting to my next clips. Oh, um, sorry. That's <laughs> sorry. Right. I'm, I'm he, stepping on your points. He, he did an episode railing against one of his favorite targets, the national conservatives, for only focusing on going after the left. But then he ends up using that as part of his own rationale for not responding to CRT as much. People always ask, Yohan, why don't you do more on CRT? Why don't you do more? Because they, all these guys are doing it, I, and I'm not like them. And uh, they, they do a pretty good job ridiculing CRT and ridiculing these other things, but it's, it's bo it bores me because everybody else is doing it. So, I mean, does that sound like someone who's fully energized about fighting woke CRT? No, I mean, that, that's... That's a pretty lame excuse. I think, you know, he's not going to do something because other, you know, everyone else is doing it. Well, that's completely not objective. If, if something should be done objectively, then it should be done. You know, you, it shouldn't concern you like, oh, someone else is doing it, so I don't have to do it. <laughs> you know, well, if it's, if it's the right thing to do, then you do it. You know, but for him, he's got to be unique and distinct and differentiate himself from everybody. That's his priority. So that's he can't be doing the criticism of CRT when it when other people are doing it, because then he looks like them. You know, so I don't know. He, I guess he couldn't find a unique way to criticize CRT. You can't worry about what other people are doing when. You're focusing on doing the right thing for, uh, you know, for the culture, or for, for your values. You know, I, I have this vision of uh, people in the third century seeing Christianity just sweep through the Roman Empire like wildfire and, and some pagan saying, well, I was going to criticize Christianity, but everyone is doing it. I, I find it boring at this point. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, that, that goes that goes back to a point I made in a prior episode about him um, not recognizing the importance of you know strength in numbers or that numbers are numbers are important. Sure. So if you get more and more people criticizing something, then the voice gets louder and more people hear it. So I don't know. It's it's not everything, you know, uh, quality matters, but numbers also matter. So I think that's just something that gets missed in all of this, in this question of like, what should we be doing? Well, some of it is a question of sanction and, and you know, the willingness to work with other groups under what circumstances. I mean, I, I talked to uh, someone at ARI on Twitter and I was saying, look, you know, is there any context at all in, in which you'd work with libertarians? How bad does it get? How much, you know, would one side have to create an authoritarian government? And he's just like, nah, no way, not with those guys. And that's just, you know, that's someone that's just decided that they, they'd rather, um, you know, live under totalitarianism than work with unsavory people that they find less than perfect. I have this image in my head of, you know, that Titanic sinking. And when, when people realize that the Titanic is sinking and they're going to die, you know, some people get together and they, they try to, you know, huddle together and die together. And then there's that, the lonely guy off in the corner who, who's like, I'm going to sink alone. I'm, I'm not going to be part of your group. You know, I'm going to go do my own thing and die alone. That's kind of how I, I see people like you're on is they, they don't want to take a side. They'd rather go off in the wilderness and, and die alone than fight, you know, on one side and try to, you know, destroy the bigger target, the bigger enemy. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know what else to say about that. Yeah. Well, later in that episode, he gets to my question. And uh, even though this time I started out complimenting Elon Journo's piece on woke as a religion, he, he still doesn't like my question. I, I guess I wasn't being Scott enough. Um, but uh, for, for those that haven't read the dim hypothesis, in just brief a summary, we've kind of touched on this, but M2s are misintegrators that are long-term threats like a new religion, whereas D2s are disintegrators. They're kind of nihilists who destroy in the short term, which can lead to an M2 taking power, which is, in briefest outline, your own rationale for seeing the, the bigger threat from the right. And uh, here's my question. Scott, uh, I liked Elon Jono's article on wokeism as a new religion. Well, of course you did. I mean, anything attacking the West, the, the, the left you uh, uh, love. Do you agree and does it imply that wokeism should be considered M's per dim instead of D's? No, no, no. I've, I've said this like, what? How many times have, I, have you asked me this question, Scott? How many times have I disagreed with you? Just give it a break. No. Because wokeism is a disintegrative ideology. It's about breaking stuff. It's not pro anything. It's about shutting people down. I think at some point we should do a show on dim because there's a, a lot of question about what is a D, what is an M. Yeah, and we've and touched on that. Yeah, and I, I think that Yaron gets it wrong in this case. And um, I, I'm coming to the idea, this is like a proposition, that there's really no such thing as a D2 in, in practice. I think it's impossible. I, I think that you can't live, you can't, you can't even live one life, let alone have a collective that's devoted to disintegration you wouldn't be able to integrate as a collective. You're at some level, every evil movement, every evil regime is an M2 surrounding, sur they're, they're trying to integrate their fantasy with reality. And at that level, at that core philosophical level, they're misintegrators if their fantasy does not match reality. So, 
I think that's the core that might maybe dim is missing that I have to read the book again. Yeah. Um, but I just don't think you can have a D2 movement. Um, and so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be concerned with CRT as a D. I think it's an M. Yeah. Well, I mean, everyone but your own seems to think that. I mean, is it at least fair to say that I've made it clear to him that, uh, that I don't think he's taking woke seriously enough? Yeah. I mean, he's saying I asked, you know, bring up the same thing over and over with him. <laughs> well, the question, the, so the question is, is he taking it serious enough? Like how, how serious should he be taking it? Well, yeah, it, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, who you should be supporting in the culture or even politically. Uh, there's different ways to uh, see it as, as true, but just to dismiss it as nihilistic when they've been kind of, you know, we see these things like DEI and ESG taking over institutions. I, I mean, you know, you can't just ignore that. But what I'm asking you is put aside his rhetoric, like what, whatever he says about um, how much he's attacking CRT or how much you want him to attack put aside all that and focus on his actual attacks, like his actual episodes on the woke movement or the woke ideology, CRT, et cetera. Is, is he attacking it enough for you? Like, or should he be doing more? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of just boilerplate. It's like, okay, CRT is um, bad, you know, um, but yeah, this goes back to Leonard Peikoff's fact and value, where he says every is implies an ought. And so, you know, when you're not just paying lip service to something, I, I mean, you know, when you're continuing to support uh, the, the party of woke or say, even say you don't want them to lose less or you're worried about the reaction to it, that, um, you know, that's just... <laughs> That, that's making, you know, what it, there's a difference in what you're saying and what you're doing and, and even who you're advocating to vote for. Do you think that your problem with him centers around his vote, like the way he stands politically and not necessarily the way he's addressing the woke problem? Like he, you can be addressing the woke problem calling it evil and pointing out all its problems and how it's this terrible influence in schools and all that. And then you can have this pl weird political view that the right is a long-term threat. And so we have to strategically put Democrats in power, um, which isn't really related to criticizing CRT. It's just a, like a long-term strategy, like in politics. Do you think your, your problem with him is his political stratagems? Well, it's, it's a combination of, you know, I was a Kelly fan relatively early on. And so, you know, I'm used to this people saying you're not a real objectivist. And I left the movement for a while. We've talked about this in past shows, but um, you know, by the time I came back, it was, um, you know, probably mostly around 2016 or something right around the time of the election. And so, you know, to hear um, even by 2019, when I, you know, hearing about your own and the fifth column comments, it was like, I already saw woke as a major threat. And so it was the combination of not seeing that and using that to say, oh, and if you, you know, are too worried about woke, you're not a real objectivist. And so it's like the combination that set me off. He's wrong and he's using it as a way to like kind of intellectually bully people that I already had a chip on my shoulder about. Okay, but do you think he's he's um, changed enough? You know, he's like regrets doing that or like he's addressed the issue enough that we can move on? No. Uh, <laughs> You know, that's why part of why we're talking about it, um, you know, and part of the inspiration for doing this show uh, this past August, Yaron and I really got into it when he was trashing CPAC for hosting Hungary's Viktor Orban. And I said offhandedly in the chat that 
you know, Orban is mixed to be sure, but that those people in, in Hungary are rebelling against European centralization they lived through under socialism that they see in these EU controls. And, you know, Orban did help fight Soviet occupation in the late 80s. Yet your own still decides my comment is beyond the pale, exclaiming, you know, Orban is not mixed. There's nothing good about Orban. There's not a single virtue that Orban represents. And I'm reminded of how Kelly was unfairly drummed out of the closed movement for, for suggesting we can't automatically know a Marxist professor is evil because Yaron seems to see this as his opportunity to publicly condemn me. It boggles my mind how, Scott, you can claim to be an adherent to Ayn Rand's philosophy, you can claim to be an individualist, somebody who believes in individual freedom and in capitalism. Orban doesn't believe in capitalism. He's a, everything in Hungary is crony. Um, Orban doesn't believe in individual freedom. He believes in Christian nationalism. Orban doesn't believe in freedom of speech. He has respected speech throughout Hungary, particularly of the media. Orban doesn't believe in anything you profess to believe. But because he's not on the left, because he hates the left, because he's anti the left, well, he's mixed. Hitler was mixed by that criteria. You know, I don't call him mixed because he stands up to wokeism or the left. I, I call him mixed because I do think he should rein in his illiberal tendencies. But I don't think he's nearly as bad as someone like Erdogan, who's actually in NATO, for example, or Xi or Putin. I think Yaron is so touchy because he knows, you know, I don't think he's doing enough to push back on wokeism. And so it's a chance to attack me for just saying Orban was mixed. Yeah, I mean, he's focused on your psychology again. Uh, he's wondering if you're honest instead of just answering the question. Well, can I bring up something about your interaction with Euron? Yeah. So I think that you both are at some level trying to convince the other of something, but you're not, neither one of you are going to be convinced because you're, you're both solidly on your own sides. You want Euron to attack, you want Euron to attack the left more, and Euron wants you to stop bothering him. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't. He's not trying to. He's trying to tell his audience and people in the chat that may think I say something relevant that, you know, I'm I'm terrible. I'm not a real objectivist. I, you know, I'm, I'm uh, morally evil for thinking Orban was mixed. Yeah, I mean, but the rhetoric has gotten to the point now where he's calling you names and he's associating you with me and then calling me names <laughs> when I'm not even there. I'm not even in his chat anymore. Well, we'll so, get to the... So we'll... I'm, I just, I'm just want to ask you, do you, if neither one of you are going to change your position, I mean, he's not going to attack the left more than he wants to and you're not going to stop bothering him. What, what's the point? You know, what, what, it, what are you trying to achieve? Someone I admire once promoted the idea of pronouncing moral judgment. Are you going to judge? Are you judging him? Well, I think by even in saying that I disagree and why I disagree. I mean, uh, you know, his negative attitude towards me is because of me saying, making the judgment that I don't think he's fighting the left enough. Okay, but what, I mean, that's just a fact, right? You're, you're, you're putting that out there as a fact, not your, not just some allegation or opinion. Like he's, he, you're saying- it's judgment, he, I mean, he's, it's, not, uh, he's not attacking the left enough. What does that mean? Like how much should he be attacking the left? It, he talks about wanting to differentiate himself. How about differentiating from libertarian bromides, always saying both sides are equally bad and uh, for starters? Is that so that was a libertarian? That's a libertarian well, point? It just, it, you know, it, it honestly is any kind of uh, mushy moderate that 
will take any two sides like Israel and the Palestinians and use moral equivalents to say both sides are equally bad. And, you know, that's the same type of thing. It's just, it, it, it is, I mean, libertarians do it as well for them, at least in the party, they have a little bit of a justification because or that's, that's their whole reason for voting libertarian because both parties are, are bad. Um, but in, in a case of like, a, you know, philosophical people that are just trying to identify reality, I mean, don't just say things that, that are patently absurd. And uh, now so here. So here it, it, it sounds like a conflation, though, to me that you're, you're trying to put your on in the libertarian camp or at least libertarian really. I, ideology. I'm, I'm trying to make a point about differentiating himself because he was saying it's important to differentiate himself in, in attacking the right. Yeah, so that's not moral relativism, right? He's, he's saying that the right is the bigger threat. He's made, a, he's made a conclusion that the right is the bigger threat when it comes to politics, you know, voting and all of that. So he's got this strategy, <laughs> which seems ridiculous to me now. You know, like, <laughs> Back back when Peacock was promoting this sort of thing with uh, voting for Kerry, I kind of was on his side, but not fully. Uh, I didn't quite grasp what was going on, I guess. But now I just see it as ridiculous. Like, if you think that the right is the long term threat, then how is voting for the right's enemy going to get you in there in the in the right's good graces because the right is just going to see you as being on the side of the left. Now you're, you're saying that Trump is bad and let's, you, you know, I want Biden to win, you know, more than I want Trump to win. So if you start talking to Republicans, they're just gonna, they see two sides here. And so they're going to see you no matter how you try to differentiate yourself. If part of that differentiation is that you're, you're calling Trump the worst thing and Biden is, you, could, you should vote for Biden or implying that you should vote for Biden. Well, that's not differentiating yourself in the eyes of the right. You know, the right's just going to see you voting or promoting people should vote for the left. Well, he'd say he doesn't care what the right thinks of him. And I understand that, but it's more just what you know, objective people that are seeing what's going on and saying, you know, it's the same with these never Trumpers. They, you know, it's just like, how come even after the election, you guys still seem to always see things from the mainstream perspective. And, um, but in response to him calling me out publicly like that about Orban being mixed, I got angry about him straw manning me. So I typed in the chat, you know, like the pass you give the left. And admittedly, it, it wasn't my best moment, but it honestly represents how I see things. Uh, but your own disagrees. I don't give a pass to the left. I condemn the left as evil, as destructive, as horrible. I don't say they're mixed. There's nothing mixed about critical race theory. There's nothing mixed about, uh, you know, about anything, about socialism. There's nothing, I debate the left more than I debate the right. I cover the left on this show more than I cover the right. I condemn everything about the left. I can see that's odd to me. If why would you cover the left on your show more than you cover the right? If you think the right is the long term threat. None of it makes any sense if you analyze it on that level. <laughs> I mean, I would be focused on the long term threat. And that's what I'm focused on. I think the left is the long-term threat, the greater threat, which is why I promote helping the right fight them. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, he says he condemns everything about them, but I, I just go back to that, you know, is versus ought. You know, if you're still preferring these uh, mainstream center-left candidates, um you know, he's been telling us he's going to be spending the next months and years exposing and undermining conservatives. Yeah, I mean, he has a deep hatred for the conservatives. And, you know, I understand that. I mean, they have let the religious element take too much control. Uh, I don't like that either. But I think what's happening is 
we're on the verge of some sort of major takeover, major authoritarian takeover. And I don't think it's the right who's going to be doing it. I don't think I don't think religion has that much political influence on the right. It's it's there, but what is the worst thing the right is doing religiously? Well, they'd probably point to abortion and uh, you know that's the- not even that's not in the Bible. That's some hocus pocus that is being that is on both sides. They're, they'd say yeah. it's being driven Everywhere. by Christian nationalism. It's not, it doesn't even have to be Christians. It can be Jews, it can be Muslims. There's all sorts of religious elements out there. Even you can, you probably can find some progressives who have a problem with like late term abortion. You, you, they, there's a lot of people now finding excuses to regulate abortion. And it's not just the Christians. Yeah, so, I, I understand that. I'm just saying this is the type of thing they'd say anytime, like basically anytime the right wins an election, like the, the Republicans taking Congress, uh, if they do in two weeks, it'll be like, aha, you see, there is still a vibrant right that we need to be worried about. Mm-hmm. Well, and, you know, but uh, then in this, uh, this, Next clip, uh, he then tries calling me dishonest. I mean, the idea that I give a pass to the left is disgusting, Scott. It's dishonest because you're on the show enough to know that that is not the case. The fact that I consider the right a bigger threat than the left is not giving the left a pass. Well, it's giving them a pass on who's the bigger threat. (laughs) Right. (laughs) You can't take both positions. I mean, he has a right to that view. But, you know, he can't say he's, uh, you know, as strong on the left as, uh, as, you know, as he is on the right. And he shouldn't be for how he believes. Yeah, at some level, I think you're talking past each other. I think that when you use colloquialisms like uh, giving someone a pass, you know, maybe each side doesn't understand how that's being used. I don't know if that's the problem or if it's something, you know, more significant, but he's clearly getting pissed off and you, you have this effect on him where you, you just make him angry and he admits it. I think it's because I'm hitting at an issue that there's not a ton of consistency on and, and just picking at that issue exposes that inconsistency. But frankly, have you ever asked yourself why he cares so much what you say? Like, why, why is what you're saying making him pissed off? Has he ever met you in real, real life? Have you ever, you know, talked to each other at a conference or something? I mean, one or two, but I, he didn't know who I was. We didn't really talk. Um, I, he acts like you have this personal relationship and you're, you're, you're like, you should be doing something better with your life or you know, like, like he's like acting like a father figure with you. Like, why are you here annoying me? Go, go annoy somebody else. You know, like, I don't know. It's like, I don't understand why you make him so mad. I mean, I know you, I, we have this relationship. I've met you and you don't, you know, make me angry. You don't piss me off. Even when you say things I disagree with, it's like, I, he gets real hot under the collar. He's an emotional guy. And I think he lets that affect him. And when he's live streaming, it's hard to check that, right? Because um, if you let your chat affect you that much and <laughs> you get all angry because someone in your chat said something, that's, you know, that doesn't say much for your ability to stay calm and reasonable. Well, it's funny. You say, at the time, I wasn't listening to the show, but he kind of later admitted that's where the fifth column comment came from, that he'd been in kind of heated discussions with his chat. Yeah, I just I don't get it. I don't I don't know why he takes his chat so seriously. Yeah, You know, I mean, he just I think he, uh, you know, takes uh, some some criticisms personally. I'm trying to be substantive and, and talk about it in the context of the culture. I mean, he and I continue going at it. We'll we'll put the link in the show notes, but I'm still getting angry myself. So I just add a a snide little, you know, I'm voting the same way as Peacock. 
that you can vote any way you want. Uh, you know, I don't care how you vote, that's not the issue. The fact that you're an apologist for the worst people on the right, that I find offensive. You can vote for whoever you want to vote. Your vote, luckily for me, doesn't really matter that much. I guess he's uh, offended by objectivists who, quote, apologize for Trump because he's he's like the leader of the movement and and he you know that he's got to look at that and he's got to see it every day is that why he's offended i i think he was talking about they are me apologizing for orban by calling him mixed and okay, i wasn't so apologizing for him i was assessing that you know he's not 100 percent evil <laughs> so, so now if you're um apolog you're you're apologizing for orban now you're you're dishonest <laughs> so i don't know who can you apologize for these days <laughs> well um, you apologize you apologize, start apologizing for rand see how that goes i just think if, if it were true that he doesn't care how you vote why did he say he's planning to spend whatever influence he has in making sure Trump doesn't win if he runs in 2024? He's got TDS. Well, that's uh, one analysis. Um, at this point, uh, then some other person, Justin, in the super chat says, I love Orban as an objectivist. And Jerome calls him delusional. Justin loves Orban as an objectivist. I think you're delusional, Justin. You, you either, you're either delusional in your love or delusional in an objectivist, but you don't understand objectivism if you can love Orban. Um, yeah, I know I'm insulting people, but that's okay. It's more of that was... class customer service that's helped ARI grow so much under his tenure. <laughs> yeah, well... That's, was Justin being serious? I don't even know Justin. Or yeah, I don't know him about. either. But I assume he was. I think there's probably you know people that appreciate Orban for standing up to the EU. And yes, you can say you know oh he's been an apologist for Putin or he's had you know done some illiberal things. Uh, but I mean that's you know it, that's what makes him mixed. And uh, it, I'm not saying he's he's all good. I'm I'm saying there's issues with him, and you know I'm, maybe that other guy was Hungarian. Well, I don't. So it, I don't know whether to assume you're on nose, Justin, or or not, because it sounds like he knows him very well. He knows that he can't be an objectivist, <laughs> you know, just from this one comment. And he's delusional. So he's yeah, he's delusional. So it sounds like Yaron has a very close relationship with Justin's psychology. Yes, to be able to make a psychological pronouncement, he must be a licensed uh, therapist himself. Um, <laughs> but also yeah. that he's not an objectivist. Now, I thought ARI was no longer in the business of saying who is or who isn't an objectivist. Wasn't that what Of Schisms was about? Yeah. I th yeah, I thought so too, but apparently you're on, you know, doesn't agree with that. <laughs> well, at this point, I say in the chat, it's less objective to say Orban's 100% evil. Yes, it's completely objective to say Orban is evil. Yes. I could say he might do something good if he ever does something good. He hasn't. Orban's no. never done anything good. I mean, I mentioned him standing up to Soviet aggression in the 80s. How objective is it to, to say that, that uh, to, to an objective listener? Well, even if we limit the context to Orban's political life, um, it's probably not true that he's 100% evil. <laughs> um, I don't know the man. I can't make an evaluation, but that doesn't stop someone like Yaron from doing it. Um, if I were to guess, I'm, I'm guessing that Yaron knows Orban very well. They have a close personal relationship. He knows all about Orban's political life, his history and everything he's ever done. And that's how he can make that evaluation. Sure. I, I mean, Yaron goes on to say that he's evil because he has control over people's lives. And I say in the chat that are voting for him by overwhelming majorities. And uh, your own replies by saying, yeah, people voted for Hitler too. And then I reply in the chat, Orban isn't Hitler. And 
he then tries to equivocate to say that's not what he said before abruptly ending the show. Yeah, people vote voted for Hitler too. People vote against their self-interest all the time. People do vote in the really, really bad ways all the time. So people vote for him, so what? So he's popular. Stalin is popular in, in, the Soviet, in Russia today, very popular. Stalin would win an election in Russia today. So we should all support Stalin. He might be mixed. Maybe Stalin's mixed because people vote for him. I didn't say Orban is Hitler. See, you're not being objective. You don't, you don't listen to what I actually say. Bye, everybody. So, so what, you know, go ahead. What, what he actually said, what, I mean, he said that, um, so you said that there were people voting for Orban. And then he said, yeah, people voted for Hitler too. And so what he's, what he's implying, I guess, is that um, there's some level of evil there that is comparable right. to, to people voting for that, for that level of evil. I don't know, um, I don't know like what his point would be if he's just saying, yeah, people vote for people. People vote for politicians. Okay, that's what kind of point is that? I, I think what happens is he's unable to make a moral differentiation between Orban and Hitler because I, I, I think there's very few people that end up being mixed. And so they all end up either being good or evil. As a one quick postscript, this ended up being from last night's show. Someone asked, your own about Elon Musk. And, uh, you know, he recently made some comments about Russia and China. And your own showed, I think, you know, an inability to see people mix as he expresses guilt for ever seeing anything good in Musk. Elon Musk. His response to Gary Kasparov's valid criticism of his peace plan was to call him a name for feminine hygiene product. What does the disrespect and public discourse say about the culture? It's truly horrible. And the people are justifying Musk because he's a hero for them in business is just pathetic. And I feel bad about all the good things I said about Elon Musk. Well, on one hand, I'm glad to see that Yaron regrets something that he once said. <laughs> but, but, on, but on the other hand, uh, uh, I'm not sure it's uh, that important, you know, to talk about that. I mean, what's, what's his point in uh, just saying, oh, I don't, I don't like what I used to say about him because of something he said now. Like, is that, it reminds me of when he was um, talking about Jordan Peterson and they invited them, invited him to Ocon and they had a conversation. And then afterwards, suddenly Jordan Peterson is a dangerous person and you, you shouldn't, you know, take him seriously and all that. Yeah, I, I mean, with Musk, I came to see him as a hero in 2019 when I watched live on, on the Space Coast, um, you know, a, a spent fuel booster land back on the platform uh, right off the coast. I mean, it's an amazing feat of engineering. So, you know, it, you can say, uh, that there may be things about him that, that I disagree with, but to actually uh, say, you know, I, I, I regret the, the good things I said, it, it's kind of like a rewriting of history. It's like when, um, you know, Nathaniel Brandon gets kicked out and like his name has to be taken off the dedication page and stuff. It's just like that level of uh, once they, they've done something to transgress, I mean, he, he can't seem to see Elon is mixed. Even if you really disagree, he's just making some comments about politics. He's still a, an incredible creator that we should. And, and also he was saying, um, oh, these people that are, you know, that give him a pass because of his business success. I mean, I could say the same thing about people like Jeff Bezos uh, that that end up working with the government, you know, and, and uh, supporting a, kind of, it, with the Washington Post, supporting a, a bigger administrative state. So it's just, um, you know, it just ends up being this kind of almost subjective thing where you pick which business people you like or which you don't. And, and the, the good ones are Hank Reardon's and the bad ones are Oren Boyle's or, or Hitler, if you can't make any finer distinction than that. Well, you know, I think this is par for the course for people who make 
these black and white evaluations of people. They, they judge them good or evil. Um, what happens is you make these sweeping generalizations about someone and then later you, they do something you don't like and then you have to kind of try to backtrack on your generalization, which was ridiculous in the first place. So how do you do that? Well, you just have to admit that you regret saying these things you once said. Did he describe exactly what he said about Elon Musk previously? Or did he just generally? No, it was just that comment. Uh, he didn't get specific. Yeah, he just there's some general things I said in the past about Elon Musk, about liking him, regret it. And I'm like, oh, right, well, that doesn't help me very much. Yeah. Well, I, I, I didn't want to get too sidetracked on that. After the, the show where he and I got into it on Orban, on his next show, in response, uh, one of his more sycophantic fans uh, suggested blocking me from the show. And um, I was surprised to find out that I may not be his least favorite person on this podcast. All right, Liam, uh, I think it's time we put Scott Schiff on the permanent YB show block list. He's just a dishonest nihilist troll. I mean, I think there's a lot of truth to what you say. Um, and particularly given that, that, I, that I've learned, I, I guess I didn't know this, that he also participates on another YouTube channel where a big chunk of what they do is just attack me uh, with a particular disgusting human being that he, that he, that he uh, co-hosts the show on. You know, at least I've differentiated myself from all the other disgusting people in the world. <laughs> I know I've been asking him some tough questions. I understand his anger at me, but what the hell did you ever do to him? I know. I, I'm a particular disgusting human being, which means <laughs> he's singling me out. I'm unique. <laughs> I, I don't know. You two seem to have maybe a worse history than he and I do. Uh, yeah, we probably do. I've actually worked with him, so... Okay. All right. That's uh, giving us a little clue. Well, that, that could be a whole separate show. Yeah. But I don't know if he wants to go there. Um, <laughs> I don't really want to go there. It's not relevant. But so how I just, can I be a nihilist if the left are supposed to be the nihilists and he thinks I'm too sympathetic to the right? Yeah, it's a confusing mess. I mean, you're not just nihilist, you're dishonest and you're a troll. I guess trolls are I mean, are trolls in intrinsically dishonest? I don't know. Troll um, means anyone the host doesn't like. Uh, no, I, you know, I, I mean, look, I'm trying to ask substantive questions. I'm not like going on there saying you're a poopy head. I mean, I'm talking about the culture and things that I genuinely care about. Oh, I wish you would go on there and call him a poopy head. That would be pretty <laughs> funny. <laughs> now, now to your own credit, he actually says he's not interested in blocking people unless it's something more egregious than, than what I've done. So I'm not a fan, um, but I, I don't want to block anybody. Uh, I think what you can do as an individual is block him. Uh, you, can, you can go into your thing and, and do something that prevents you from seeing his posts. Uh, but I don't want to start policing this. It's just not worth it. Um, and it's it's just uh, it's just going to be work, and then the borderline cases, and they have to decide. It's just, but you can as an individual. I know a bunch of people, uh, you know, uh, blocked the other guy. I forget his name, who is an obnoxious uh, is is particularly obnoxious on the chat. Just you decide whose whose comments you want to see and whose you don't. I I don't want to get into that unless somebody has really 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 crossed the line in terms of how offensive they are. Yeah, you'd have to get like William level offensive for him to recommend that block people. <laughs> I wasn't even there. I don't know. Um, I don't know what he's referring to. So is he is he talking about my my hygiene or like what I is disgust what is disgusting about me? I don't know. No, I still don't know. But I mean, you know, I, I appreciate where he's coming from. But even in this, he's kind of trying to have it both ways. It's like he's subtly encouraging blocking by minions, you know, while, you know, he's claiming he's not the blocking type and, and he's not. I mean, he's I think he's genuinely curious about conversation about him, even critical conversation. And I, I do think, uh, you know, he, he, he deserves appreciation for that. 
but it's you know it's the same type of subtle messaging when ARI claims they don't act as arbiters for who's a real objectivist, but then you know they're still uh, not willing to work with these groups that they don't think are real objectivists. Uh, I mean, um, I guess uh, you know you're not a real objectivist uh, unless you think uh, Orban isn't one hundred percent evil. Yeah, well, it's a little boring to me that, you know, whether what he thinks is a real objectivist, I don't really care. I mean, he's, I know he cares. I mean, it's important to him who a real objectivist is, but I just focus on, who, who I just focus on the to? ideas. Go ahead. Well, it affects who people talk to. He's kind of saying to these people, don't talk to these other people we don't consider not an objectivist. Yeah, but anyone I've been interested to talk to, you know, has either replied to me that, you know, they don't want to come on the show or they've actually come on the show or chatted with us. So it's not like they stopped talking to me. It's like, I, it's, it's, it's what, what Euron thinks about me or us or uh, whether he calls us, a, you know, accepts that we're objectivists or not. I don't care. It's not really affecting me. Yeah, well, I mean, I just think um, it, it it does affect uh, the level of collaboration that is possible within the liberty movement. So I do think it's relevant from that perspective and their attitude spreads. I've seen libertarians say, uh, you know, politics is downstream from culture. And it's just like, that, that's just become so, it, I mean, come on, you guys are a political party. Politics has to be relevant to someone. In truth, I think it's all happening at the same time, but um, I, I don't want to get. A, wasn't that an Andrew Bright, Breitbart saying? Or who, who said that? I don't think that came from objectivism. I, I, it was certainly, it's certainly repeated by objectivists. I don't know if Rand originally came up with it or not, or if it uh, someone else did. We could research that, but. Um, I yeah, know what, what objectivism will, will say, you know, is that politics is an application of morality to the question of how to build a society uh, or in a government. So it's, it's like uh, culture includes the political discourse and, and the government and everything. So I don't, I don't think objectivists would say that politics is downstream from culture. It's like I've heard cultures say that. Well, I, I haven't. I don't. Who who has said that? I mean, I could probably dig up a clip of your own saying it. Okay. Well, then uh, I would probably disagree. <laughs> well, as a bit of a, a postscript to all of this, since that fight, um, you know, your own was in the UK last week, and it seemed like these UK students were telling him how much they saw woke being everywhere. And that they even blamed the U.S. for exporting it, and that fact seemed to have made your own see that that woke is dominating after all. So, you know, you've got a you've got a situation today where, um, across the educational spectrum in both the United States and in the, and in the UK, you have wokeism uh, dominating. Now, arguably, this is a bit in a treat. Again, I, I, I would mention, I would mention Virginia, and I would mention San Francisco. Uh, but it might be in retreat in some areas, it might be, but it's under the surface everywhere. And it's certainly, to a large extent, in many school districts, dictating much of the curriculum, and it seems to be very much alive and well. So, I mean, even though he, he tries going back to his woke is in retreat kind of saying for a second, but I mean, he, he can't even convince himself. And, and I, for one, am happy to see his change of heart. But when I try to say so in the chat, he condemns my comment. Scott says, very happy to see you appreciate the woke threat. Um. That is such a disingenuous comment, Scott. Uh, it is such an evasive comment. I think we need more context. <laughs> but it's certainly a backhanded compliment, but 
it's not disingenuous for me to be glad he's he's no longer fully pretending woke is in retreat. I mean, this is what I've been trying to tell him that I've I've wanted him to do more. I, I don't know why he's shocked at, at my reaction to that, but even he has to acknowledge that that it is my actual perception. And here's well, that maybe question. or go ahead. Well, as I was just to say, maybe he's he's reading that, you know, as sarcasm. Um, and maybe there's some miscommunication there because he says it's disingenuous. I don't know if that's the right word that he wanted to use. As we know, Yaron um, doesn't use the right word sometimes. So and just like most of us, sometimes we slip up and we say something off the cuff that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so I don't know if that's what's going on in this clip, but I hope yeah. he is as charitable with you. <laughs> yeah, but basically what he just read doesn't doesn't smack of you know sarcasm to me. I guess it's well, I, I mean I pro I probably was being a little sarcastic. I, I can't uh I'm not gonna pretend that you know I haven't been you know trying to edge him in this direction so that it's you know partially just saying, yeah, I'm glad you're seeing it. Um, you know, like we've I, been talking about. And I think that's that wouldn't be sarcasm, would it? <laughs> well, I, I sarcasm mean, is something you don't really mean. I think. Yeah, I, I do mean it. It just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, I didn't you're say giving, specifically. I'm glad some, you're coming around. Yeah, it's like finally, you know, like it's. Um, I don't know. But even he has to acknowledge it's it is my actual perception. You know, this argument that I don't take the woke threat seriously because I, I see a threat from the right as well is so disingenuous and, and borderline dishonest. It just is. And and you exhibit this or you keep repeating this nonsense um, in spite of the fact that you're here and you listen to me. And, and here I am constantly talking about this stuff and you choose, you choose not to hear it. You choose to hear only what you want to hear. You have a perception of what I think. And you you blank out anything that doesn't meet that perception, except once in a while, for some reason, something hits home and, oh, look, you're on. He's paying attention to the woke. Complete garbage. I think the problem here is that you do a decent job recording everything he says, and he doesn't care what he says. <laughs> so I think you may be getting to the heart of it. I'm like parsing his words like he's a Clinton or something. Yeah, he just speaks for an hour or two to fill time and make money, and then it's gone. Um, unless he actually writes something down, I mean, he's not going to remember everything he said a year ago. So like a year ago, he says CRT is boring for him, and, and now he's complaining that you don't think he takes it seriously. You know, like, so, you know, he doesn't remember everything he says, so he doesn't see the little contradictions he's making. I, I mean, can you blame me for being confused about his consistency when he sometimes thinks CRT is too boring or doesn't differentiate himself enough, yet, you know, other times he, he claims to be its most consistent foe? I mean, we can't just take every side of an issue. At a certain point, you have to take a stand. Uh, Scott says you have to take a stand. No, I don't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that one may have been a little out of context. <laughs> yeah, that's something you put on TikTok. <laughs> but yeah. uh, in but serious it, but I, You know, I, he, he made the same mistake when we were arguing about um, monuments on public property. Right. <laughs> he said right. something like, you, um, there is, you don't have to have a position. <laughs> well, I pointed out, well, that's a position. So, it's, <laughs> so he doesn't have to take a stand. Well, that's a stand. Exactly. Not choosing a side is still making a choice. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I do think um, what really part of what's going on here is the bigger the threat that is out there, the less justification for these eternal petty grudges with other liberty groups. And so admitting that, you know, we're in trouble means that, oh, now they have to start talking to libertarians again. Yeah, well, I hope they do. 
I mean, you know, they have to uh, start talking to more people if they want to influence the culture. If the goal is to spread Ayn Rand's ideas, you got to talk to people, talk to anybody who will listen. Yeah, uh, but they, I don't know, at some level, they understand that. And at another level, they get confused and re revert back to the die alone strategy. Yeah. Oh, um, one more postscript. This came from earlier this week. Somebody asked Harry Binswanger uh, whether he considered critical race theory a D or an M per uh, Leonard Peikoff's dim hypothesis. And even Harry agrees that uh, it's the bad one. Would you classify critical race theory D or M as per Dr. Peacock's D I M terminology? Thank you. I could make a stab at it, but I'm I'm not uh, one who uses that um, uh, trichotomy. A critical race theory is determinist, and it's intrinsicist so it would be on the um m misintegrated but the bad you know he has two levels of the really bad one it's like religion in that regard so, so it, appears, it, <laughs> go ahead. it appears that both peacock and ben swanger have rejected dim not even so much that they've rejected dim but that they've come to see woke as a kind of religious unifier of the left that turns it into the potential for, for an M. Well, Harry said he doesn't use the trichotomy. Right. And um, apparently Peikoff hasn't been using it. So I'm, I'm assuming that since Peikoff is voting for Trump, he's not uh, on board with the dim prophecy anymore i believe he said something that seeing the the threat of of national socialism from the democrats was consistent with his dim hypothesis oh he did well i i didn't see that but you know i mean is it harry and leonard especially as the creator of the dim hypothesis are, are they the ones interpreting dim wrong well Ben Swanger didn't create it. Right, but Peacock did. Yeah, Peacock did. So yeah, I would I don't know. I'm uh I don't know what's going on in Peacock's mind. Let's just put it um, that way. And I'm not gonna speculate. That's fair. Well, I think the uh main takeaway from all of this is that um Despite everything that, that happened, uh, I still think it's fair to call you mixed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. For some people, mixed is the worst thing you can call them. Yeah, mixed in the head. <laughs> Good. Well, uh, you know, I, I like to think that we've at least made our case and why this uh, idea of using dim to to justify just kind of uh you know taking this both sides mentality or always just being watchful of the threat coming from the right while ignoring the woke march through the institutions uh is worth questioning yeah well let me make a point about dim um because it has been used to justify voting for the democrats um i think that there may not be such a thing as a D2. And I think that focusing on the long-term threat is a problem, especially if you're trying to apply DIM to that question. I think most people would look for the most immediate threat. Like when you, when you start talking about what is a threat and, and what are my priorities when I'm dealing with threats, you, you tend to put the long-term threat off and focus on the most immediate one because that is the most lethal one usually. It has a, it's going to kill you first. Well, like you, there is something to be said for still not 
you know, only focusing on the short term and not considering the long term. My ad, it's just, you know, he's been saying that the left has been winning for the last hundred years. At what point is it no longer a short term threat? No, I mean, what I'm saying, though, is that you do focus on the short term threat because it's the most immediate one. And you can also address the long-term threat. And usually you do that by addressing the short-term threat because they're related. But let's say you're looking at the right as the long-term threat and the left as the short-term threat. Well, you may never get to the point where the long-term threat threatens you because you're dead already. The short-term threat got you. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's only coincidentally that someone would use long-term threat, uh, as an excuse to uh, avoid the short-term threat. Yeah, it takes this twisted ideology to get to that point. I think if we were to focus on it and do a show on it, I would have more to say, but these are my initial thoughts, my initial points. I think there's this, there's this problem of trying to apply DIM to voting because then you start focusing on the disintegrators and the misintegrators, and it gets very abstract and you start losing focus on which party is trying to brainwash your children right. against you. Yeah. Yep. And uh, not everyone wants to see it. And I think that's part of the issue, but we'll kind of gauge, um, you know, reaction to this show and, and use that to decide about doing a follow-up uh, more specifically about DIM. Um, I think we talked a lot about a, a lot of really good things today. Um, you know, I think the main takeaway from this is that, uh, you know, your Ron likes me more than he likes you. Nanny, nanny, boo, boo. <laughs> <laughs> well, you win. Good job. Any other final thoughts? Uh, no, no, it was a pleasure. Uh, yeah, it was a fun episode. Uh, so uh, anyway, this has been the Ayn Rand Fan Club. I'm Scott Schiff, along with William Swig, and we will see you next time.